you were talking about the time that you were the most scared out of everything that happened during the service and it had to do with the, music, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember specifically some kind of a party at the officer's club Friday night. During the, the party, Wayne Commander came in and announced that all crew members leave the club immediately, go into crew rest. We knew about the missile crisis. We knew that things were getting really tense. So it was no surprise when he made that announcement. Well, it just so happened that the next day, two of our airplanes launched fly airborne alert with nuclear weapons on board. And uh, our crew was one of the two crews. And at that time, I was a co-pilot. And uh, we were, uh, our 24-hour airborne alert mission took us from Altus, Oklahoma, to Moron, Spain, to Moron, Spain, where we refueled over Spain and then uh, flew in a holding pattern until we had to head back to Altus, Oklahoma, and it was a 24-hour mission. So we took off just about at dark, and we're out over the middle of the Atlantic, and this is at the time when everything was just hour by hour as to what was going to happen with this crisis that was underway. And we were, this is, without a doubt, Doug, this is the closest we ever came to a nuclear war was the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were so close to having a nuclear war. At any rate, we're out there over the middle of the Atlantic, and uh, all at once, it's totally dark, and all at once, the sky out in front of us starts lighting up. And I am thinking, okay, they have just nuked our tanker base in Spain. World War III is underway. And, I mean, I was just terrified. I called, there were two airplanes. I called the other airplane, and I said, do you see what I see out in front? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, have you heard anything on the radio? Because that's how you get the go code strike your targets in Russia. said, no, I have, we haven't heard anything, and neither had I. And about that time, we had an undercap. About that time, the full moon broke through the undercap. And I, to this day, Doug, some 60 years later, every time I see a full moon, that's what I think about. I mean, I was so relieved when I realized that that light was from the moon breaking through undercast and not a nuclear weapon going off over Spain. Well, terrified I've ever been because I thought this is the end of the world as we know it with a total all-out nuclear war. It's going to be whether the planet will be inhabitable or not, who knows. So that was the scariest thing of all. Do you recall the, the date of that? It was, it was 19, what, 1962? I, think I, I, I want to say 63. 63. It would have been the fall of 63. Okay. And how many how many uh, children did you have at that point, if you don't mind me asking? I, I can't imagine all the things that were racing through your head. Like, if this is going to happen, they're not even going to know what happened. You know what hit them, and here I am up in a, up in a bomber doing my job. But but at that point, how much of the human element came into your into the back of your mind? How much of you just being a husband and a father came into your mind at that point, or were you just fo laser focused on your job? In the event that there was a, they had information that Russian bombers were heading to the United States, they had an evacuation plan in Altus, Oklahoma, where they were going to evacuate the family to a lake about 20 miles north of, uh, of Altus. And I told my wife, I said, don't go, don't bother evacuating because if they hit, if they hit out with a nuclear weapon, you want to be just when that hits because people that are going to suffer are the ones that survive the nuclear bombing. That's going to, I mean, it's going to be a terrible way to die for the survivors. You don't want to go quick. So just stay, just stay in our house and out. And if it happens, it happens. That's what I remember about that. Uh, personal feelings about it, but once airborne and once on the mission, then it was more focused on the job. Okay. 
So, like I've told you before, sir, if you're uncomfortable talking about something, then you know just say so. But do you mind? Yeah. Do you recall how your wife responded to that? And and again, this is this is personal. This is very intimate details of of a very traumatic moment in not only the country but but in your personal life specifically because you were privy to information that nobody else really in this country or the world really knew at that point. I don't remember. I do not remember what her response was when I told her that. But in dealing with things like that, she was really very strong. And in fact, she was an RN. Uh, she didn't practice at an RN after we were married. But in our neighborhood where we lived in base housing, everyone knew that she wasn't, that she had been an RN. And any time something physical came up where there was a physical problem or something, they, all the neighbors would call her and say, what do you think about this? Like if the kids had something, uh, they would call her and ask her for her opinion on uh, what she thought. So, But she was strong, and but I don't remember. I do not remember specifically how she responded when I told her. Well, I know from experience that the, the families of military members are, are all right along for the ride for, for many of the scary and stressful events that the actual military member himself or herself is going through. I have a, a, an immediate family member who is married to a, an army officer, and there's been times in the past that things have come up and things have happened that have been scare, scary for all of us, and you don't really know that until you are a family member of, of a military person that it, it does trickle down to, to the immediate family, even, and, and then some, the, you know, when somebody's in danger, um, it, it's, it's, it's stressful and it's, it's worrisome for, for everybody involved. Uh, my wife said that, uh, she had been, it was a Sunday and she was shopping with a couple of our daughters and then at this, this, uh, mall where she was shopping on the PA system, they announced that there had been two more B-52s shot down. Uh, the night before, and she told me when I got back that she just had a very bad feeling about that when she heard it, and then she got home, and at about midnight, the doorbell rang, and she said there wasn't any doubt in her mind what it was, and it was the wing commander and the base chaplain and the squadron commander there, and they just told her, they said, uh, you're shot down. We don't know the status, whether he's dead or alive, or the status of his crew. We just know that, they, that he's been shot down. And so uh, that was what she had to deal with on the 22nd of December, three days before Christmas, and with the kids, the uh, most difficult thing for her, I think, was having to go ahead and have Christmas for the kids. Uh, with getting that information days before. So that was a pretty tough time for my wife, sure. I can't even imagine, sir. And uh, how long was it after you were actually shot down that, uh, how, how did it work? How, how were you able to get word to your wing, or how, how was word able to get out that you were actually alive still in, in, in a captivity at that point? Okay. 